Let's go ahead and get started. Question number 51. You are assessing a 60-year-old male with severe chest pain. When communicating with the patient, you should what? B is the correct answer, yes. Um, using any specific medical jargon is not going to help you in terms of communicating, regardless of your patient. So child, adult, elderly, I mean, anything in between doesn't really matter. Um, don't make assumptions about their level of education. Don't make assumptions about how much they know about medicine. So uh, make it as easy as possible for them to understand. You also do not, you don't want to do C. You don't want to avoid answering direct questions. Um, if you avoid answering direct questions, that's going to cause patient anxiety, not relieve it. They're not going to be like, oh, they're telling me nothing. That means it's probably fine. They're going to think, oh, they're telling me nothing. That means I'm about to die. Like, that's just, that's how everybody's brain works. So answer questions as directly as you can. Um, communicate as clearly as possible in terms of the words you use. And like I think we said last time, don't try to offer false hope or try to cover up the truth of what's happening. Just be honest and be professional. Um, number 52, you have just administered subcutaneous epinephrine to a 22-year-old male from his anakit. After properly disposing of the syringe, you should what? So this question is a little bit outside of our scope of practice uh, because it's talking about the anakit with the epinephrine and syringe, and we don't deal with it that way. We have the EpiPen. Um, so if you kind of were to just take out that particular set, just talk about an EpiPen. After you use the EpiPen appropriately on a patient and then appropriately dispose of the leftover piece, what would you do? Look at the question that way. B, transport at once, carefully monitor his condition. Um, none of the other stuff applies in this case. Number 53, you are dispatched to a local high school track and field event for a 16-year-old male who fainted. The outside temperature is approximately 95 degrees Fahrenheit with high humidity. Upon your arrival, the patient is conscious, alert, and complains of nausea and a headache. His skin is cool, clammy, and pale. What should you do? Okay, so I know I've said that whenever oxygen is a choice, it's pretty much always the answer. This is one of those kinds when it's not. And in general, when oxygen is not the answer, it is because it's talking about a specific situation that it wants you to know. Like in this case, the situation is hyperthermia. So those situations would be hyperthermia, hypothermia, um, pregnancy. Um, there's a few others that are like specific and they're as or uh, abuse, um, drugs, uh, animal like like animal bites, stings, things like that. Those are times when they want you to actually kind of know what's up in terms of that specific situation or condition and how it's affecting your patient. So oxygen might be the correct answer in those, but often you do want to look at the other choices to see, do any of them really specifically pertain to the correct way to handle that situation? So if the, if the choice in this case isn't oxygen because it's one of those specific situations that they want you to understand, what would you say instead? Okay, C or D, yeah. So A, you know, we never give a patient anything to drink, and we don't carry liquid salt solution. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, we already know it's not B, because I told you guys. And between the other two, which one is the most, the first thing that you would do, the most basic first thing? D, D get them inside the cooled ambulance. Um, so when you've got a heat-related injury, you want to immediately start cooling them down. Um, Assuming, you know, we're, we're obviously not having to worry about things like checking airway and stuff like that. It's talking about the situation. You want to cool them down as quickly as you can. Um, if it was a question where it was kind of reversed and it was like that the patient had been outside um, and had a cool body temperature and like had frostbite and what would you do first? The first thing would be to try to get them warm in the most basic way possible. Whether that's, depending on the choices, whether that's bringing them inside, heating up your ambulance, taking off their wet clothes, things like that. It's really talking about the basic first step to deal with that situation. Number 54. You are treating a 20-year-old male with a history of diabetes. The patient states that he is not feeling well. His vital signs are stable, however he is confused and his skin is cool and clammy. You attempt to obtain a blood glucose reading with your glucometer, however it reads error after three attempts. After administering 100% oxygen, you should what? Right, so what does this tell us about, okay, what do we know about his blood glucose? Do we know anything? 
No. We know that he has a history of diabetes, um, and we know that we can't actually get a good reading for whatever reason. Sometimes some glucometers, um, if, it, if the number gets too high or too low, like if what it's reading is just totally outside of what it can normally read, it'll give you an error message where it'll just say high or low. There's a couple different reasons why it would tell you an error message. So we don't really know what's going on there. Um, however, if we look at somebody having too high of blood sugar versus having too low of blood sugar, like we know he has a history of diabetes, and so those would be the two options if it's a diabetic problem. What does too high of blood sugar look like in a patient? What's the easiest way to tell from the outside? Okay, so in both of them, you're going to kind of see those altered mental status things. Um, you might see the aggression, confusion, things like that. Um, specifically, if you're going to look at their skin, skin condition, color, temperature, for a person who has um, hyperglycemia, too high of blood sugar, you're going to see a warmer skin. It's going to be dry. Um, so think of high and dry. High blood glucose, you're going to have dry skin. That's the, um, what looks like more on that side. On the opposite side, if somebody has low blood, glu blood glucose, they have hypoglycemia, it's going to be pale, cool, and clammy. So if you were just to look at their skin presentation, and that's one of the few things that tells us here about this patient, um, that might give you a clue as to whether they have high blood sugar or low blood sugar. So in this case, this patient has cool and clammy skin, which we could assume means low blood sugar, right? So in this case, you'd want to go ahead and give oral glucose um, and transport. When would you not give oral glucose? What would the question say that would make you not give oral glucose? If they're unconscious or if they can't swallow. If they're so unresponsive or, or not fully responsive to the point that um, you don't feel like it would be safe for them to swallow something. Because oral glucose is it's like a gel and you have to swallow it. So that's a contraindication. Um, any questions about this one? Why wouldn't it be C? Why wouldn't it be C? If you write it on it three times, it's probably not going to change. You know, one time can maybe be like user error. Two times, maybe still user error. But you've done it three times and gotten the same message each time. And it would just be unlikely that it's... <laughs> yeah, the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. But, um, or I think the actual thing is insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. Regardless, it wouldn't really do you much good at this point. You could do it again, but it's not... It's kind of avoiding the question again. It's like, you could do it, but that's not the best answer. Um, if you look this one up online, you will find that at least in one location, it is listed as the correct answer being A, perform a detailed physical exam at the scene. Why would some people think that is the correct answer? Because you always examine your Sorry? You always examine your patient. You always examine your patient. Um, and you don't know what's wrong with him, so what is, the, what is there a chance that's going on if it's not a diabetic emergency, since you can't find that out for sure? Could it be trauma? Or any, a number of any other things? Like he's altered mental status, pale, cool, clammy skin. He could have some kind of trauma that you don't know yet. So doing a detailed physical exam is certainly not a bad idea, um, and I understand why it's listed that way in some places. However, in my opinion and in Randy's opinion, based on what was given in this question, um, oral glucose is still the better alternative. It's still the better choice. So you can, look, you can look these questions up online, and I mean, I would suggest you do that to some degree. There's a ton of question banks out there that you can just type in and find huge amounts of questions. Um, however, to some degree, take them with a grain of salt. Um, it's not always guaranteed that the question or that the answer on there is the correct, like official correct answer. Sometimes people post things that aren't correct. So... Question number 55. You've been working at the scene of a major building collapse for eight hours. Many injured people are still being removed, and everyone is becoming frustrated and losing focus. This situation is most, effectively mani most effectively managed by what? I'm going to give you all a chance to read this. So the answer to this one is B. Um, looking at the answer choices, none of, them, none of the others really have, like, have any real effect. A and D are both bad ideas. You don't just want to give caffeine indiscriminately, and 15 to 30 minute increments of sleep, it's not really going to fix your problems. Little power naps, yes, they can be useful in some cases, but in this case, it's just, it's going to be more of a mess. There's nowhere good for them to sleep, and you just, everyone's becoming frustrated, so it's not like a 15 minute nap is going to suddenly fix the problem. Um, CISM is a critical incident 
um, I should have looked this up ahead of time, something management team. Basically, it's people who are trained for this kind of thing. So if it's an ongoing problem uh, or an ongoing situation that you're trying to deal with, somebody probably will have already called in a CISM team to help kind of handle it and organize it to make sure that everyone is getting the proper rest and nutrients um, and everything that they need, but also making sure that the problem is being dealt with appropriately. Number 56. While at the scene of a motor vehicle crash, you determine that there are two critically injured patients and that another ambulance is needed. You attempt to contact the dispatch with your portable radio, but are unsuccessful. What should you do? So the answer in this one is actually D, um, is the best answer. Your portable radio is going to be the little, like, almost like a walkie-talkie kind of type thing um, that you carry with you. A lot of services have sort of, they sell these things where they're a cell phone, but you can also press a button and it turns into, like, a, a radio, and it does double duty on the same device. Um, and that's what you'll probably be carrying if you're out on scene working for a particular company or a department. However, in the ambulance, you should also have a radio that is going to have a much better signal. And so that's why you're, you're assuming here that your portable radio is just not able to give a good signal or not able to stretch far enough or, or something. Maybe there's terrain or something that's like blocking the signal. So you'd want to go to the better radio. Um, use your mobile radio in the ambulance versus ask somebody else to use their portable radio, which is also probably going to have similar problems. That's why the answer would be D. Number 57, you are treating a 40-year-old male with a documented blood sugar reading of 300. The patient is semi-conscious and breathing shallowly and is receiving assisted ventilation from your partner. You should recognize that definitive treatment for this patient includes what? So what does definitive treatment mean? Definitive treatment is actually going to be whatever treatment is necessary to fix the problem. You provide interventions, which are supposed to intervene and kind of hopefully make everything a little bit better, but you're not definitive treatment. Definitive treatment is what they're going to receive usually um, at the hospital or wherever you're taking them to. It's going to be something that will resolve this problem. So you've got a patient whose blood sugar is 300. What should blood sugar be in a normal patient under normal circumstances? What's the range we, we like to see? It's about 80 to 120 is the number that you'd like to see pop up. Um, much outside of that, and you, you, know, you should be aware there might be a blood sugar-related problem. This guy's blood sugar is 300. So is he hyper or hypo hypoglycemic? Hyper. Hyperglycemic. Too much blood sugar. What would we give to a patient? Um, assuming you had all the tools at your disposal, what would you give to a patient to help lower their blood sugar? Insulin. Insulin. So dextrose would be... Um, it, we give oral glucose, but if you were a paramedic, you could give something called D50, which is a better version of that that goes into the IV. And it, the D part is based on dextrose. It's another name for a different kind of sugar. Anything that ends in that OS, if you remember from like chemistry, is a type of sugar. Lactose, suco, sucrose, glucose, all of those. Um, glucagon is something that I believe, if I remember my physiology, um, it's what your liver uses. It, like, it converts um, into glucose glucagon and then it converts back or something like that. It's been a while. Um, at any rate, you wouldn't give that to a patient. It's just something that happens in your body. Insulin is the thing that you would want to give to lower somebody's blood sugar uh, to a normal level so that they wouldn't have this problem. It would fix the problem. 58. You are dispatched to an office building for a 49-year-old male with chest pain. When you arrive at the scene, you find the patient to be conscious and alert, but in obvious pain. He tells you that he did not call 911, but a coworker did. He further states that he does not want to be treated or transported to the hospital. What should you do? So is this patient capable of making a consent decision? Yes. Conscious and alert. He's in pain, but there's no sign of any sort of mental issue that would make him incapable of making that decision. So clearly, um, B and D are wrong. You're not going to transport them anyway against their wishes, and you're also not going to tell him straight up, you're having a heart attack. Like, you don't know that. He has chest pain is all, he, is all you know at this point. 
Um, until you do an assessment, you can't tell them that. I mean, I say you want to be honest and professional with them. This is going too far. This is like fear-mongering, telling them something that's not really true necessarily. Um, it's not a good persuasive technique, and it's also going to get you in trouble if you're just like telling people the world is about to end to try to get them to let you treat them. So the answer is A. Y'all are correct. Um, remember, consent has to be informed, meaning they have to know everything, and expressed. So refusal also has to be informed and expressed. He's expressed that he does not want treatment, but he still needs to be informed about all of the appropriate risks and benefits involved in that choice. 59. A 33-year-old woman who is 36 weeks pregnant is experiencing scant vaginal bleeding. During transport, you note that she suddenly becomes diaphoretic, tachycardic, and hypotensive. In addition to administering 100% oxygen, what should you do? Okay, so let's look at what's going on with this patient. Um, well, let's look at what we can automatically disqualify. For sure, C is definite no. Why? Do you ever put gauze into anything? No. You never pack it in. You never, especially into the vagina. You just don't do that. Um, do you, would you begin assisting her ventilations at this point? No. We don't know anything about how she's breathing, so that doesn't really seem to fit. Um, you would give oxygen, but there's nothing to indicate that she actually needs ventilatory assistance. So we've got those two positioning questions, either in a left lateral recumbent position or supine and elevate her legs. Why would you position her supine and elevate her legs? Like, what's the thought process behind that? Okay, because you see, what she, you see what's happening. She's bleeding. Um, she's had some amount of bleeding. Scant means not a whole lot, but we don't necessarily know how much that means or how long it's been going on. Um, she's diaphoretic, tachycardic, hypotensive. So you're seeing potential signs of shock. And for shock, you give them oxygen, you elevate their legs, you keep them warm, right? Um, however, the one qualification to that is that she is pregnant, and she is very pregnant. She's 36 weeks along. Um, there's a condition called supine hypotensive disorder. I don't remember what the last word in that is. Uh, supine hypotension, though. It, it's something that happens with pregnant women. The baby, especially when the fetus is so much larger, like it would be at 36 weeks, is putting pressure on everything, right? Including, when you lay back, putting pressure on the aorta and the vena cava that are running at the backside of your abdomen. So if the baby's putting a lot of pressure on those, um, it's going to cause hypotension in somebody because the blood's no longer able to flow freely, it's kind of getting trapped down in the lower extremities, and all of a sudden you don't have enough blood up in the important parts to properly function. Um, so you would not want to position her supine, even though you're trying to control for shock, because it would be making the baby put pressure on the aorta and the inferior vena cava. The best position at this point would be that left lateral. Do you all know what recumbent means? It means just lying down. It's not like a specific term, but if you see that, you'll know. Left lateral recumbent means lying down on your left side. Yeah. Um, and out of all these options, that is the best one because we know the other two aren't correct and then that positioning her supine might actually make the process worse or the problem worse in this case. Number 60, a 75-year-old male with a terminal illness has died at home. As you and your partner enter the residence, a family member becomes verbally abusive, pushes you, and states that you took too long to get there. What should you do? The answer is A, yes. Um, remember, when you're dealing with a patient, your first responsibility is always to your own safety, then to your partner's safety, then to your patient's safety or the, the safety of bystanders at that point. So at this point, the, um, we had a question, I think a couple times back, that was talking about how somebody was getting verbally abusive, and the difference here is that they actually push you. So we crossed the line from just calling you a name um, and like being upset with you to physically touching you, um, at that point it, you would want to remove yourself because you don't know. The next step up from a push is a punch or something. And you don't want to be in that position. So your own safety is paramount. And frankly, um, your patient has passed away. Like he was passed away before you even got there. So typically if the, if the family member wasn't trying to hurt you, your typical responsibility would be to comfort the family members and try to... Um, 
care for their emotional well-being at that point and then make sure that, you know, it was being handled correctly. But your patient has died, your family member or the family members are being hostile, your responsibility is now to yourself to get yourself out of there safely. Do y'all need a break? Okay, I'm going to keep going because nobody moved their head. 61. A 35-year-old woman who is 30 weeks pregnant presents with a severe headache and swelling in her hands and feet. She is conscious and alert with a blood pressure of 148 over 94, a pulse of 100 beats per minute, and respirations of 24 breaths per minute. During transport, you should be most concerned with what? So when we look at a pregnant woman with hypertension, what should we be thinking of immediately? Okay, um, that's not the wrong answer, but that's not the answer I was thinking. Let me a we ask the question. What condition should we automatically start suspecting? Pregnant woman, hypertension. Do you remember preeclampsia, that word? Okay, do you remember what preeclampsia is? Preeclampsia is essentially characterized by high blood pressure in pregnancy. Um, it's called preeclampsia because it can lead to eclampsia, which um, is a seizure condition that occurs during pregnancy. It's got some other complications, but that's the main part you should be aware of. Based on that knowledge, which of these answers would be correct? Which one should you be concerned with? B, the possibility that she may experience a seizure. That's one of those things you definitely need to be aware of. Um, this question about when you see a, a pregnant woman with hypertension, immediately think preeclampsia, Remember, that's high blood pressure in a pregnant woman. That's like a specific condition that includes that um, vital sign. And then immediately think eclampsia. Like if preeclampsia isn't treated, it can be treated by a number of different things. Uh, but if it's not treated, it can lead to seizures and other complications. And that would really be not good. So the answer is B. Um, the, others, the, the others aren't like necessarily incorrect answers. It's just this is one of those situational things where they're really wanting you to know what preeclampsia is, and they're expecting you to think immediately towards that side of things. Number 62. A 23-year-old male experienced severe head trauma after his motorcycle collided with an oncoming truck. He is unconscious, has rapid and shallow breathing, and is producing copious bloody secretions from his mouth. How should you manage his airway? So, he has rapid and shallow breathing. What does that mean you know you're going to need to do? You're going to have to give some sort of assisted vent like ventilations because rapid and shallow is just not going to be enough. He also has those copious, meaning a lot, of bloody secretions. So what else are you going to have to do? You're going to have to suction. Okay. Now, all of these, well, rather, not all of them because D does not include suction at all, so you know that's not going to be correct. Um... A, why is A incorrect? Yes, that's not our suctioning procedure that we know. We, you do not suction until all secretions are removed. What's the longest amount of time? 15 seconds. So remember, you go in with no suction on, put suction on, um, come back up suctioning as you come out of the mouth for no longer than 15 seconds. So definitely not A or D. Now, when would you need to put in an NPA? Okay, so you'd need to put in an NPA if they require an airway, in other words, if they can't keep their airway open, and if an OPA doesn't work. So remember, OPAs are for somebody who's unconscious with no gag reflex. If you've got a patient who um, has a gag reflex or is conscious, you would not use an OPA. You'd go to an NPA. Uh, we don't know. There's no choice in here that says OPA, so we don't even know if that's something they would be offering. Um, but there's not really anything that makes me think we would need to put in a manual airway. Um, he's unconscious, so we don't necessarily know whether or not OPA or NPA is necessary. We just don't know much about whether that's necessary or not. Looking at C, what does that have like, to its benefit? First off, it says the 15 seconds of suctioning, which is how long you're supposed to suction for. So the fact that it has that like, fact in there is nice. Um, and then it also includes the assisted ventilation. So it's giving you very specific information about what exactly you should do. It's not that an NPA is... It's not that an NPA is wrong, it's that we don't know that it's right compared to the other, the other answer. The other answer more like specifically answers what we're talking about here. What would make B wrong? 
there's one thing in there that you can imply that would make B B wrong. What's the contraindication for oh, yeah. EPA? Remember that? When would you stick something in somebody's nose? No. Looking at that very first sentence, he Medical has... Medical trauma. Any kind of head trauma at all is a uh, contraindication for NPA. Any kind of face or facial trauma or head trauma. Because you don't know whether or not the base of the skull is fractured. So the uh, if you put an NPA in, then uh, it can, in it can theory, poke through. go okay. into the cranial vault. There's, there's stuff on YouTube, there's videos. Yeah, that's a good point about the trauma. I don't even think of it that way, but that's completely correct. Um, if you do look it up, you can see there's, like, pictures of somebody with a nasogastric tube, like, three feet of it coiled up inside where their brain is uh, because somebody put it in without paying attention and just kept, like, inserting, and it was coiling up in their brain because they had a skull fracture, and it was going in there instead of down um, into their stomach where it was supposed to. And that person obviously didn't survive because you don't survive with three feet of plastic tubing where your brain should be. So it's kind of severe. Number 63. While on duty, your partner asks you out on a date and touches you in an inappropriate location without your consent. What should you do? D. Yes. A is not enough. Uh, B is not enough. C is way too strong. Um, having your partner arrested is a little much right now. Um, D is what would be most correct. So you don't want to just ignore behavior like that. It's unprofessional and it's inappropriate and it's sexual harassment. Um, you definitely need to report the incident to your supervisor because, among other things, it is their job to maintain a safe, non-threatening workspace. And if you're allowing that stuff to persist and not letting them know, you're not giving them a chance to deal with it appropriately and make sure that problem doesn't happen with someone else. Number 64. You are attempting to resuscitate a 50-year-old male in cardiac arrest. He is on the second floor of his home. What is the most appropriate device to use when carrying him to the first floor? The answer would be A. So if you've got somebody in cardiac arrest, what are you doing for them treatment-wise? Cardiac arrest, you're giving them CPR, right? Okay, yes? Okay, you're definitely giving them CPR if they're in cardiac arrest. Remember, for somebody who's in cardiac arrest, they need a flat, firm surface underneath them. Um, of these options, the long backboard definitely provides that. Wheel of stretcher would be awkward and inconvenient. Folding stair chair doesn't seem to fit. You've got a male in cardiac arrest who needs resuscita resuscitation. He's not able to sit up in a stair chair like, while you're bringing him down. Um, and again, a portable stretcher is just not as good. That long backboard is what's going to appropriately have you move him and then you're still going to be in a good position to continue CPR and continue moving him out of the house potentially onto your stretcher um, into the ambulance. 65. A 50-year-old male presents with an altered mental status. His wife tells you that he has had a small stroke three years ago, but has otherwise been in good health. The patient is responsive but unable to follow commands. After administering oxygen, what should you do? So he has a history of stroke, right? And he has an altered mental status. He's not able to follow commands, so what does that tell us? Does he have good motor control? Okay, so what should your immediate suspicion be at this point? He might be having another stroke, yes. Based on that, the fact that he might be having another stroke, you gave him oxygen, um, what is the next thing that you need to do? The answer would be C. So remember, when we look at our stroke scale, when we're looking at how to evaluate a stroke, um, 
you remember the F-A-S-T, right? F is for face, so you're looking for facial droop. A is for arms, you're looking to see if um, there's a difference in terms of motor control. S was for speech, so you're trying to see if they're able to speak clearly or if they're slurring words. Again, looking at all of their motor control questions. Um, he's not able to follow commands, so all of those to some degree are moot because he's not having that control. And what does T stand for? Time. So if you suspect a stroke, time is incredibly important. If you get them to the hospital within a certain range of time, they have drugs that can potentially, if it's um, an ischemic stroke, they can break up the clot and allow free blood flow and hopefully reverse all effects of the stroke. Time is incredibly, incredibly important because if you don't give those drugs within the correct window, they don't work. So the answer to this is C. What was what? S, uh, speech. You ask them to speak. You try to see if they can say something, if they can produce the words. Okay, so F is for facial droop. A is for arms. You have to. You try to have them um, move both arms identically. You're trying to see if both sides are equal. Because remember, a hallmark of a stroke is one-sided weakness, uh, based on the way the brain is, and based on the way a stroke usually will attack one side, or it will usually happen in one side of the brain. S is speech. And then T is time. I thought y'all had a chart up in here, but maybe not. Okay. Number 66. You guys ready? Any more questions about strokes? Okay. A 44-year-old construction worker fell approximately 20 feet. He is unconscious and unresponsive with slow, shallow respirations. After completing your rapid assessment and caring for immediately life-threatening conditions, your priority should be to what? B. Yes, the answer choice is B. That is correct. So, based on what's happened, remember, when we do our patient assessment for trauma, we go through level of consciousness, general impression, ABCs, uh, major life threats, and then we have to transport or not. We have to basically decide whether or not we're going to transport at that point. That's before we do any detailed physical, uh, the detailed physical exam, before we take a history, before anything else like that. Um, you want to go ahead and decide transport or not. Based on this, unconscious, sh slow, shallow respirations, do you think transport is necessary? Yes, immediate transport in this case. Uh, based on the amount he fell, you're expecting there to be major problems. You don't want to hang around and wait. So any of these options that involves you waiting around or doing something else before you transport would be incorrect. Number 67. A conscious and alert 29-year-old female with a history of asthma complains of difficulty breathing that began after her morning jog. The temperature outside is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. On exam, you hear bilateral expiratory wheezing. After providing 100% oxygen, what should you do? So when it says bilateral expiratory wheezing, what does that mean, that phrase? She's wheezing on both sides when she breathes out, not versus when she's breathing in, that expiratory is breathing out. Antihistamine would be like something for allergies, like a Benadryl or something like that. So would you place her in a recumbent? Remember we said recumbent means just lying down, generally speaking. Would you have her lie down to make breathing easier? No, that's like the opposite of what you would do position-wise. Um, would you ask if you can give an antihistamine? Yeah, there's no indication that there's al an allergy problem here. Um, it's cold outside, so it's not like there's anything blooming that would just kind of be natural allergies around. So that doesn't really seem to fit. Um, would you call medical control and ask how to proceed with treatment? It's not really using all of your knowledge. In this case, the answer would be D, because you want to find out if she has been prescribed an inhaler. Remember, we don't know anything yet about her past history or medications or anything, but in this case, it would be reason. Well, sorry, we do know she has a history of asthma. So it would be reasonable to assume maybe she's having an asthma attack. And if she's having an asthma attack, she should have an inhaler. And if she has her inhaler with her, we can help assist her with a dose, or she can take it herself. And that'd be the way to handle this. Number 68. A 40-year-old male intentionally cut his wrist out of anger after losing his high-paying job. 
Law enforcement has secured the scene prior to your arrival. As you enter the residence and visualize the patient, you can see that he has a towel around his wrist and a moderate amount of blood has soaked through it. What should you do? Yeah, again, this is one of those things where it's like, what is the first thing you should do? Even though that word first is not included. You identify yourself when you're dealing with a patient. That makes sense. Number 69. A 48-year-old male was stung on the leg by a jellyfish while swimming in the ocean. He is conscious and alert, but complains of intense pain at the wound site. Specific treatment for this patient includes what? I don't actually expect you all to know this. Um, the answer for this would be A. I will caution you, though. You're probably not going to see too many questions like this on the test, if any at all, something like this specifically. The reason being that depending on the kind of jellyfish, it makes a big difference in terms of how you treat. Some, you wouldn't want to use vinegar or use hot water. It would cause major problems um, because every jellyfish is different and their venom is different. So this specific question, it says the answer is A. Like that's what I was able to find online and that's what the best practice is that is kind of, I guess, generally accepted. Something acidic, um, and then the hot water, those are both kind of, I guess, generally good ideas. But in a real scenario, if you're actually working near somewhere that has a lot of jellyfish or, you know, if you're uh, working at a beach one summer or something, I don't know, randomly, you would want to make sure you knew local protocols depending on what stung him because it would be important to find out what actually stung your patient. But the answer is A for this particular question in this case. Number 70. You are transporting a 40-year-old male with respiratory distress. The patient tells you that he recently had a positive TB skin test and is currently being evaluated for possible tuberculosis. What should you do? First of all, possible tuberculosis, does that mean you can stop treating your patient? No, remember, that's not an option. Um, you do want to protect yourself, and the best way to do that I'll just tell you, would be A. So if you put a non-rebreather on your patient, for one thing, you're giving him oxygen because uh, he needs that, right? Respiratory distress. Um, for another, it is somewhat of a barrier between yourself and him. And then the HEPA respirator, those are the ones that have the filters and they're really well controlled. It's way more than just a regular simple face mask. It's got, like, stuff on it. Um, it's going to be much better protection for you in terms of stopping those germs in case he coughs or something like that. Because a patient who's in respiratory distress, he might be coughing or wheezing or somehow doing more, like putting more out there than just straight up breath. Um, and you certainly do not want to catch tuberculosis if that's what he has. B, remain at least three feet away from the patient, doesn't allow you to treat your patient. So that's not a good choice. Um, a nasal cannula on the patient and a sterile, sterile surgical mask on yourself um, again, doesn't really fit. It's not enough oxygen for the patient, and the sterile surgical mask is just one of those simple face masks for, like, stopping blood from hitting your mouth, like what you'd use. Uh, that's not going to stop all the germs in the air. And surgical mask on yourself and a HEPA respirator on the patient, no. You give yourself the good stuff. Your patient needs oxygen. A fits both of those criteria. Would you like a break now? Okay. Excuse me. So question 71. You guys ready? Your patient is a 55-year-old female with a history of emphysema and congestive heart failure. As you assess her, you notice that she is cyanotic and has severely labored respirations. In between her broken sentences, she states that she has a prescribed inhaler. What should you do? Okay, so what does your patient need as far as oxygen goes? Clearly she needs some sort of oxygen, right? So if the answer does not include oxygen, it may not be correct in this case. Um, there's a lot of clues, like she's cyanotic, severely labored respirations, broken sentences. That's meaning that she can't get out more than a few words. Like she has to stop in between, in the middle of her sentences, I mean to get another breath before she can finish what she was trying to say. 
Um, if she has a prescribed inhaler, can you still just give her her medication? No. Um, you can't even assist her with it unless you know for sure that it's required at this point. How do you find out whether it's required? Calling medical control. Yes. So the answer for this would be A, because you don't administer the medication and then give vital signs. Um, Non-rebreather mask wouldn't be enough for what we know about her, how she's in severe respiratory distress. Non-rebreather would be insufficient. And asking her when she last used her inhaler isn't necessarily a bad idea, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't answer the main question. In terms of treatment, what does she need? She needs oxygen. Not just oxygen, oxygen but she actually needs you to help her with ventilations. And the best answer, as far as that's concerned, would be A. 72. A 49-year-old male presents with confusion, sweating, and visual hallucinations. The patient's wife tells you that he is a heavy drinker and she thinks he had a seizure shortly before your arrival. This patient is most likely experiencing what? You said maybe D? Okay, so B or D, or, or maybe all I heard was B. The answer in this case is actually D. So delirium tremens um, is a condition that is associated with alcohol withdrawal, um, or just alcohol in general, I suppose. Basically, this is what it is. It's hallucinations, potential seizures, uh, things like that. That is delirium tremens. Delirium tremens is also the name of a beer. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, it's fancy in Belgian, but it's got like a pink elephant on the front. Y'all don't probably need to know that, um, but just it's associated with alcohol. Hopefully that will help you remember somehow. Um, the hallucinations and everything else. That's why it has a pink elephant on the front, because it's like the, the Winnie the Pooh thing, where it's like pink elephants on parade, that song. Like, it's a, okay. Maybe y'all don't remember. Y'all didn't have a good childhood. Um, Thanks. <laughs> that hallucination, that, that's why. Just trying to tie it together for y'all somehow. Elephants on parade. Pink elephants on parade. We can find a YouTube of it. 73. A 37-year-old male is found unconscious in his car. His airway is patent and his respirations are rapid and labored. As you and your partner are assessing and treating the patient, a police officer hands you a medication named Allopent, which he found in the back seat of the patient's car. This medication suggests that the patient has a history of, the answer is asthma. I uh, would not expect you guys to know this specific medication. However, based on what we, ha what we know about him from this question, how could you at least narrow down the choices? Yes, okay. Um, if you have a question like this, they're not going to give you a set of vital signs or they're not going to give you information about your patient that has nothing to do with the medication. Like, they're not going to have those be completely different. It's not going to be a respiratory problem that he presents with, but his medication has to do with hypertension. They're going to be connected. So if there's anything in the question that points to a specific condition or problem, at least that's a clue towards maybe what the medication is about. 74. A 19-year-old male complains of not feeling right. His insulin and a syringe are on a nearby table. The patient says he thinks he took his insulin and can't remember whether or not he ate. He is also unable to tell you the time or what day it is. In addition to administering oxygen, what should you do? The answer would be A. Okay. In B, do we ever assist them with an insulin injection? No. Um, for C, would we request a paramedic ambulance to administer IV glucose? No. Is that necessary? No. That's not necessary at this point. And you wouldn't want to just transport with nothing else going on. Based on this question, based on the fact that it's pointing to a diabetic emergency, and also he says he thinks he took his insulin, but he doesn't know whether or not he ate. So his blood glucose may have gone like through the floor in terms of insulin, but nothing no glucose for it to actually use. Um, you need to go ahead and try to give more glucose, and obviously contacting medical control would be a good idea before you do that. 
Number 75. A 51-year-old female presents with a sudden onset of difficulty breathing. She is conscious and alert and able to speak in complete sentences. Her respirations are 24 breaths per minute and regular. What should you do? A. She definitely needs oxygen, but there's no indication that she needs ventilatory assistance. So D would be wrong. Um, inserting an NPA just in case her mental status decreases, that doesn't even make sense. And performing a detailed exam and then beginning treatment, it doesn't answer the real question, which is she needs oxygen. Like that's clear in the question. So C is just kind of a cop out. Number 76. A 37-year-old male has a partial foreign body airway obstruction. He is conscious and alert and is coughing forcefully. His skin is pink, warm, and moist. The most appropriate treatment for this patient includes what? D. D. You guys should know this one. When a patient is choking or partially choking, but they're still able to cough, you shouldn't try to actually physically help them. No pounding on their back, no... Um, abdominal thrusts to try to help, you're probably going to only make the problem worse at that point. If their body is able to cough forcefully, their body is able to actually do something that's good, and it's trying to get it out by itself. If your patient stops being able to cough forcefully, then what would you do? Abdominal thrusts. And then if they lose consciousness, what would you do? You would lower them. It's not really one of these answers, but you would lower them down and begin CPR. So Because at that point, they can't breathe um, due to this obstruction, and they are have lost consciousness. But at this point, this guy is still able to help himself somewhat, so all you're going to do is encourage him to cough and try to transport him. Number 77, type 1 diabetes. What is type 1 diabetes? Yes, type 1 diabetes is the one that you're you're born with, or at least you, like, present with at an early age, your body just does not produce insulin. Remember, type 2 is the kind where your body can no longer use the insulin that it produces properly, so you have to take medication. Type 1 is the kind where you have to take a shot. We talked about this last time. 78. You are transporting a semi-conscious patient to the hospital. In route, you note that the patient's mental status is not improving despite 100% supplemental oxygen. You should suspect what about this patient? Okay, so A, hypoglycemic, we've talked quite a bit about diabetic emergencies. B, has a brain tumor. Does that really seem to make sense here? No, no that certainly would not be like a major point of suspicion um, for you at this point. Postictal state, what is this referring to? Yes, your postictal state is after a seizure. Remember, it's that, point, that period of altered mental status, confusion. Um, what, is, what typically happens in a postictal state? Does it typically improve? Yes, it, is, it doesn't last for just an extremely long amount of time. You would see improvement in their mental status, especially if you give them oxygen. Slowly they will return back to normal or near normal. However, you haven't seen any improvement in your patient, so the postictal status or the postictal state wouldn't really be accurate to what this question is describing. Um, and then experience trauma, that's, you know what that is, but that doesn't really seem to fit here. Not compared to hypoglycemia. That's a pretty clear, um, in, in this case, that's the correct answer. That's a pretty clear suspicion. If you've got a patient with altered mental status, diabetic emergency is something you always need to have on your mind. Number 79. Law enforcement has summoned you to a nightclub where a 22-year-old female was found unconscious in an adjacent alley. Your initial assessment reveals that her respirations are rapid and shallow, and her pulse is rapid and weak. She is wearing a medical alert bracelet that identifies her as an epileptic. There is an empty bottle of vodka next to the patient. What should you do? I'm going to pause this so you guys have time to read all these. So looking at these answer choices, why is A completely off the table? Yeah, you're not going to put something in her mouth. Um... She has a history of epilepsy, so it's possible that she had a seizure, and maybe that's why she is unconscious in this back alley. Um, but you don't, for one thing, you don't ever put something in their mouth, and also there's no clear indication that that's the case. Like even if she was, even if that was the treatment for a seizure, 
Um, there's no indication that necessarily there was a seizure. It's just completely wrong. Like, everything about it is wrong. Um, B, C, and D all include oxygen, so that's good. However, the answer in this case is C. Now that I've told you, why would you think that uh, C would be the most correct answer choice? Okay. So what's your indication that she needs ventilatory assistance? She's unconscious. Okay, yeah, for sure. Also, her respirations are rapid and shallow. So that should point out to you that she's not getting adequate ventilation by herself. So even if you put a non-rebreather on her, it might improve somewhat in terms of it'll give her some oxygen, but she still isn't breathing enough. Um, Non-rebreather doesn't breathe for her, so it, she's only going to be taking in what she's taking in. And rapid and shallow, it's just it's not giving her much. So the uh, epileptic part in the uh, vodka thing is just extra stuff? Yeah, it, there's gonna, you're going to have questions like this, but there's a lot of detail in them. Um, because it's trying to, you know, A was trying to distract you with the epilepsy. D is kind of trying to distract you with the vodka. Um, the fact is you don't know what's happened. It could be epilepsy, it could be alcohol intoxication, it could be trauma, I mean, she could have been mugged, like that's not clear. It doesn't tell you anything one way or another about that. What you do know is that your patient needs oxygen. You do know that your patient needs transport, they're unconscious and they're not breathing well. So go with what you know, and in this case C makes sense. Really it's that assisted ventilation that you should, that you should notice, she's not breathing adequately, in this case. Yeah, that's a real good question as far as having the distractors. Like you're saying, they're, they're just trying to throw you off. They're, what they're trying to do with the medical alert, that whole sentence wearing a medical alert bracelet, they're trying to get you to buy it on the bite box. <laughs> they're saying, oh, she had a seizure. We're going to do the bite box. So they're trying to pull you in that direction. The registry is really famous for throwing stuff out in there like that that will, that will pull you towards the wrong answer. All right? Uh, if you look at this one, this one's wrong because of this. Again, what, what we went over before, we never talked about taking anybody in for a blood test, blood alcohol test. We don't do that, right? So you know that's wrong, obviously. Now, Mary made a good point here, because uh, what I'm thinking of is practical, but Mary probably has the right answer because it's between these two answers, correct? The other ones are completely out the window. I actually put B on there because I sit back there thinking of a practical application of it. Because I'm going to throw a non-rebreather. If I picked up this patient in the field, I'd throw a non-rebreather on her, place her on her left side. Why on her left side? Well, or, or anything. They're unconscious, so you want to protect their airway. How are you protecting their airway on an unconscious person? Atraumatic. Put them on their side in case they vomit. One of the left side instead of the right side. Hmm? You were right. I just can't hear it. The stomach. It's not complete, but that's... Oh. <laughs> if you put her on the, rep, on the right side, which, which way is the patient facing in the ambulance? <laughs> that's the only reason why. Huh? That's the only reason why. If you think about which way, if you face the... 80. Your 22-year-old patient is in active labor. Upon visual inspection, you note that the infant's leg is protruding from the vagina. Appropriate management of this situation includes what? Yeah, B is clearly wrong. Do not pull on the infant's leg like somehow that's going to work. Because one leg coming out at a time does not, you know, make a proper delivery. Um, of the other choices, though. Okay. So, I'll repeat that. A is using gravity on your side um, to try to kind of have the legs elevated, the pelvis elevated, hopefully somewhat slowing um, delivery. C, placing mother in her recumbent position and rapidly transporting. 
isn't necessarily a bad idea. Um, you do want to transport. Remember, even though they're in labor, you cannot deliver this kind of unusual presentation in the field. You can't, especially with only one leg. But really, anything except for head-first delivery is not going to be the, your cup of tea. Breach position, remember what breach is? where like the buttocks are coming out first. Um, you can deliver breach in the field, potentially, but sometimes it has to go in for emergency C-section. If it's anything else, if it's the umbilical cord coming out first or one or both arms or one or both legs, it's something that you're going to have to have dealt with at the hospital. You can't properly, the baby just won't deliver properly. Um, so you would have to transport. You can't just keep going. Um, D is not necessarily wrong, but it's not really accurately portraying this. So if the leg and the umbilical cord were coming out, then you would want to make sure there's no pressure on the umbilical cord. But there's no indication of that, so it's just not really answering this question. Um, in this case, I decided that the best answer was A, based on that use of gravity. Um, the more, the better. And that's also what I found online, because I was a little unsure on this one. I went ahead and looked up to see what other people were saying. And the general consensus is A. Um, because of using the gravity to kind of help you out as far as making this, ba this woman not deliver her baby right away. Does that explain well enough? <laughs>